Hi guys. Find your seats. Hope you had a great weekend. Hope you had a great weekend. And you're all excited about this again. Um, today we will talk about uh, concepts and measurements. But before we start, let me remind you, it is seminar week. It is seminar week. You know the drill. You do the assignment. You get the assignment on Blackboard. You complete the assignment. You bring it with you to the seminar group. Uh, and you participate in the seminar club. Right? You know the drill. Okay, take out your phones, computers, tablets, whatever. I have a few questions for you at the beginning. Related to the things that we are going to talking about today. You have a different question. Okay, which question do you have? Uh, oh, there you are, guys. Oh. <laughs> okay, that's another question. Um, we'll come back to that in a second. Oh, um, let's talk about that one then first. Yeah. Um, reliability implies validity. Yeah? Do you strongly agree, agree, and decide to disagree? It's one of those exam questions. It's one of those exam questions. Does reliability imply validity? And then I want you to tell me why that is not the case. Why is that not the case? That's not true. Uh, those who disagree, those who strongly disagree are correct on this question. Reliability does not imply validity. We will come back to that later on during this lecture, but to preface it a little bit, reliability means do we measure this, the, the same thing when we go and repeat our measurements, right? So I go on, on my bathroom scale, I stand there, do I get the same number every time I stand there? That's reliability. Validity means is it actually my actual weight, right? And you see how these things can be off. These things can be different. Maybe my bathroom scale is just... Uh, it's just a little crooked, and it just adds five kilos, or it reduces five kilos all the time, right? So I might have a very reliable measure, meaning I get the same result all the time when I go there, when I stand on the bathroom scale, but it's not valid. Right? So reliability and validity are two different things, and it's important to tease these things apart, but we come back to that um, later on during this lecture. Do you guys get the other questions when you click further on? Oh my god, technology. Anyway, um, let me quickly walk you through this. So here I'm asking, you know, one of those, it's one of those sneaky questions. I'm asking you what is the answer categories for this, for these questions. And there are four different types. And these four different types we'll talk about today in this lecture as well. Nominal means something is, it's a category, you know, male or female. That's nominal. There's no order here. Ordinal means there's an ordering, there's a rank ordering like something is higher than something else, but we still don't know about the exact differences between the categories. Interval means we know about the differences between two things. Let's say uh, 25 degrees is five degrees warmer than uh, 20 degrees, and 20 degrees is five degrees warmer than 15 degrees. So that's sort of an interval here. Sort of the, we call it equidistance. So the distance between the, between the, the, the things we measure are sort of the same. And ratio scale means that there is an absolute zero. But we will come back to, to these things in, uh, during the lecture. Okay. So today, today uh, we talk about measurements. 
And measurements are, are necessary and important in, in, in all sorts of things. Or even when you go or when you do interviews or when you deal with, with library sources or when you deal with documents, you know, you find your way through old newspaper articles and things like that. You need to think about how do I come, how do I come from the concepts that I have, from these theoretical things, down to the level that I'm actually measuring, right? And that's sort of what, what we talk about today. So remember about this research process that I talked about in one of the, the earlier um, uh, lectures. Now here we are sort of in this planning phase still. You now we need to think about how we measure stuff, how we operationalize stuff. In the other slide a few lectures ago, it was called operationalization, but that's sort of within the same context as measurement. Yeah. And, uh, and then we actually choose a particular method and go and, and collect data in one way or the other. Okay, so what I want to do today, I want to talk to you about four things. First, I'm going to uh, um, go back to some definitions that we had before, and I'm going to extend them. Uh, and because we will need them to understand what is conceptualization and what, what are we talking about here. Uh, and then, um, then I jump into conceptualization and what we call operationalization. These are basically the two processes that you do to get from your concepts closer to a measure to really narrow it down. You're like, how are you going to do it? How are you, at the end of the day, what are you going to do? Uh, uh, what kind of questions are you going to ask or what, or what not? You know, how, how do you operationalize it at the end of the day? And then we will talk about these four different levels, you know, this nominal stuff, ordinal, interval, and ratio uh, scales. The different, different levels, how you can measure things. And then at the end of the day, with quality there, I will return to validity and reliability, you know, to, to these two things. Because these are, are measures, or these are sort of ways to assess how, how good are we? How good are we in, in, in measuring the things that we are interested in? Okay, so let me start with uh, some definitions. Yeah? So some of this stuff you've already seen before, I just bring it up here again, you know, that we, that we have a little refresher here, and that you, that you guys know how this extends things and, and what, what these things actually mean. Uh, when we talk about constructs and concepts, and this can be confusing. So, um, first of all, again, you think about a theory. You know, a theory is a set of interrelated concepts and propositions intended to explain and predict a phenomenon. The example that I had was this theory of cognitive dissonance. You know, this idea that, that uh, you buy something expensive, you feel bad about it, you tell yourself that it was a great purchase. You know? That's sort of this, that's, uh, that's a theory of cognitive dissonance. And the theory would be cognitive dissonance leads to mental readjustment to reduce such dissonance. Yeah? And then you see this theory is sort of a, an interrelation of these different things. Yeah? There's sort of a cognitive dissonance here on the one side and there's mental readjustment on the other side. And the theory sort of links these two things together. And that's essentially what a theory is. A theory is sort of a, a, you know, a set of concepts and, 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 and how they are linked with each other. And that's actually what a proposition is, how these different concepts are linked with each other. Okay, so now we go a little further down, concepts, right? So now concepts are our building blocks of a theory. Yeah? And here, in this case, you know, we have a, a definition that we had. Uh, a concept is a generalizable properties of characteristics associated with objects, events, or people, and it's still very abstract. So remember, our theory of cognitive dissonance says that there's sort of this internal dissonance, and this leads to mental readjustment. There you see our building blocks. Yeah? Now we have internal dissonance, that's one building block, and mental readjustment, that's another building block. So these things are concepts, yeah? and the theory links these concepts with each other. So that's a concept. And uh, then we have a construct. A construct is sort of when we, when we narrow it down a little bit. We try to make it more, more specific. Yeah? It's not like um, mental readjustment, whatever that is, right? but being happy, for example. Yeah? That's sort of more narrow that's more narrow and more specific, but it's still theoretical. Then we have a variable. A variable is a measurable representation of a construct. So that's then something that I have at the end of the day in my data set, I have a value for how happy you are. That's sort of what a variable is. Whatever that, however I came about to, to, to get to that point, yeah, to, this, to this one variable here. But it's sort of, it's a, it's a representation, it's, it's a representation of the construct that I'm theoretically interested in. 
Okay, so this is sort of the stuff that is nothing new. That's just, uh, just going back to the things that we had talked about in one of the earlier lectures. Now I add something else. Now I add an indicator or what we call an item. Yeah. An indicator or an item, you know, these things are used interchangeably, is a single measure. Yeah, for example, this could be whatever you get out of a single question. And you will understand that in, in a second. Because often when we measure something like happiness, we don't just have one item. We don't just ask one question, how happy are you? We can't do that, but a lot of constructs, you know, they're, they're still difficult to grasp with one particular thing, right? So then often we have different items, or, you know, practically it could be different questions, it could be different things that you're looking for, uh, that we, that then together, that then together form a verb, right? Or something like a sort of capital. That's still a social construct, but how, how, what is that, right? What is that? Then we would go and we would have different items, we would have different items in a questionnaire or when we do interviews or whatnot, to try to get to the essence of this construct, right? to capture sometimes also different aspects of it. So the, the indicator or the item, that's sort of the lowest, the, the lowest thing, in, think of it in terms of a question, right? that's how you can understand it. You know? And sometimes there are many questions, that together form then something like happiness you know, or something like social capital and so on. Okay, so that's an indicator. And now we also have an attribute. An attribute is essentially the characteristics or quality that kind of that these items can take. Right? So let's say one item or indicator could be yeah, biological sex, for example, and then the attribute could be male or female. And that's sort of just the values that, uh, that an that, uh, uh, that indicator can take. Okay, so these were the, the two extensions that I wanted to make to the definitions so that we know what we are talking about. Let me now move on to uh, what we call conceptualization and operationalization. Okay, so when we, the, the first thing is conceptualization. And in conceptualization, we really think about what, what do the things mean that, that we are theoretically interested in. Right? So like, um, what is love? What is love? How could we go and measure that? Uh, that's sort of a tricky thing. It's not that straightforward, right? So, but you see, this is sort of a, this could be something that we are theoretically interested in. You know? We want to, I don't know, see if people, if people who, who, who are loved or who are loved are more happy or I don't know, things like that. And then you see, it's not that straightforward, so we need to think about things first a little bit to get to an ultimate indicator in the end, or happiness. Yeah. What does it mean? What are the what are the things involved in happiness? And maybe maybe we have maybe you and I have very different ideas about what happiness is, right? So these are sort of the things or hate. What is hate? Or what is alienation? When you, when you read text or when you, also when you do your own work, these are sort of the constructs that you're working with to some degree, but you need to, you need to be clear about what they actually mean. And you need to be, we can have different ideas about what it is, but you need to be clear and make it very clear in your work what you mean with that particular uh, concept or construct. Yeah. Yeah. Or prejudice, what is prejudice? Yeah. The thing is that most of the, of, the, of the concepts you want to study and in social research, they do not actually exist like something that you can physically grasp, right? It's not like, okay, there's a heart rate or there's a rock and that rock exists or something like that. No, it's, it's often a little more tricky and we need to, we need to think about, okay, um, what do we mean by, by things like love, happiness or hate? And often it's uh, also that people have different, that's what we call a conception. People have different conceptions about what things mean. Yeah. Maybe you have a different idea about uh, what happiness is than, than what I have. And we need to agree somehow, right, so that we kind of know what we are talking about. And the way, the, the, the process of doing that, the process of doing that, making clear what we are talking about, that's what we call conceptualization essentially the mental process by which fuzzy and imprecise concepts, and fortunately in the social science we have a lot of fuzzy and imprecise concepts, 
Uh, but uh, but we can try and we should try to be uh, as clear and as, po uh, as, as uh, objective as possible with going and measuring these things. And conceptualization is the mental process by which we get from these fuzzy, imprecise concepts to, uh, 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 to concrete and precise terms. Okay. So it's essentially the refinement and specification of abstract concepts. So when you have a theoretical idea, you know, you have something like, I don't know, love matters in your theory, then you think about, okay, how can I narrow this down? What is sort of my operational definition here? How, at the end of the day, am I going to, to, to measure it? And one of the things that is important for conceptualization is to think about what is included and what is not included, what is excluded in your concepts, right? So what, what do you want to cover and which aspects do you not cover? And that's very important to be clear about that. You know, um, people can make different decisions and when, when you practically do research, you have to make decisions all the time. It's a nightmare. You sit there and you always have to decide, am I going to do this route or that route or this route or that route, right? And constantly you have to make decisions. And oftentimes, you know, you just have to make a decision, but you have to be very clear about the decision that you make. That's kind of the, the clue. Sometimes there are good arguments to go into the one direction, but sometimes they are not, but then you have to be clear and just really describe very clearly about what you're doing. So we can always discuss and, and fight about different ways of measuring something, but we can never fight with your exact precise definition about how you went about doing that. And that's sort of the thing that, that matters. You know, that's also the thing that I'm, I'm looking for when you know, I'm reviewing stuff all the time, I told you, or I'm, or I'm grading stuff, and, uh, and that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. This is sort of clear. Okay, so that's conceptualization. And, Here's one thing, you know, sometimes these concepts, they don't actually exist, right? They don't exist as these physical properties, like, like something that you can touch or so, right? Or um, um, one example that I have here is the big five personality traits. You know, that's a concept that is important in psychology, but in sociology we use it as well sometimes. It's basically a way of capturing, you know, how open are you as a person or how... I don't know, I, I don't know the five traits. It's sort of a different, five different, there are many seven traits as well, how you can sort of classify people along certain dimensions here. But these traits do not physically exist. You know, there's no part in your brain that is, uh, I don't know, that is determined how, how, how a nice person you are or something like that. You know, it's not, it's not sort of just one thing that you can pin down like that. But still it's useful to, to have these concepts and these constructs for, for our analysis, even though they do not physically exist. Okay, so one of the things when we are in this process of conceptualization is we need to, or we need to make many decisions, but one decision that we often have to make is thinking about the dimensionality of our, of our concepts. Right? What do I mean by that? Right? So is there just one underlying dimension or are there multiple underlying dimensions? What do I mean by that? Well, we can have a unidimensional construct or a one-dimensional construct. You know, that's sort of just a fancy name for what you most likely associated with this to begin with. It's really just a single thing that captures the whole construct, right? Like the weight of a cow. There's nothing about, I don't know, different things I need to think about the weight of a cow. It's just the weight of a cow. Yeah. Or um, wind speed or the height of a person or things like that. Now there's a single, a single dimension, there is a single thing that I could go and measure or ask and then I would, would have a, a valid representation of my construct. Okay. Now in contrast to that, we have multidimensional constructs. Well, what are multiple dimensional constructs? Well, these are these constructs where sort of there are these different dimensions that we should consider. Right? The example that I have here is intelligence. There are many different facets of intelligence, right? I don't know, maybe some of you are better with emotional intelligence or others with logical intelligence or with interpersonal intelligence. There are all these different things, right? And kind of throwing them all together, it's sort of a little, a little tricky or, you know, it might not, might not capture the whole thing. Or if I would just go and if I would just measure your logical intelligence or also mathematical intelligence, I would miss out on important aspects of, your, of you as a person, right? So there are these different things that we, these are now different dimensions. You see, different dimensions that kind of play a role for, um, for, for the construct that we have. 
or when we talk about uh, social capital. That's sort of a construct that we use in the social sciences a lot. Uh, there are different dimensions here as well, right? And sort of about um, social capital essentially means how much do your social ties, your embeddedment in social relationships, how do they, much do they give you an advantage, right? You know the right people to get a job or to, to, to have advantages in life, right? And, and there are different dimensions that could matter here. Could be your family, right? Maybe you have an uncle who knows the tricks of the trade, Right. Or it could be uh, the friends that you have. Maybe some of your friends are just really know their shit and they are just really helpful, right? Or maybe it's, uh, it's other people that you kind of uh, uh, are exposed to. So you see there are a lot of different aspects of different, different phases in your life maybe or different, different uh, spheres where um, just going and, and having one measure like the weight of a cow or uh, the height of a person is just not enough. So that's essentially conceptualization. Yeah? We have our concept, and we narrow it down to the construct, and we think about, okay, is there one dimension or are there multiple dimensions? Now let's talk about operationalization. Operationalization are these nitty gritty practical decisions that you have to make all the time. You know, when I'm writing paper, I have to think about how do I operationalize um, income? Yeah? How do I, uh, what are the categories that I have? What kind of, or even when the little survey that I made with you guys, you know, how do I operationalize H? Yeah. Do I ask for different H categories? I opted for going for the full thing. I opted for having you entering numbers, right? Sometimes it can be, it can be useful, and as you see later on, uh, when you do it in a more extensive way, like me entering, uh, having you entering the numbers, I can always create H categories afterwards, but I cannot do it the other way around. Once you kind of, you enter, I don't know, you're between 20 and 30, uh, I don't know your exact age anymore. I cannot, I cannot make that data up anymore. So operationalization is sort of the process where we develop indicators or items for measuring constants. Yeah? Conceptualization is also on this theoretical level. You remember what is sort of included in the whole thing? What do I mean by social capital? What do I mean by intelligence? And things like that. And then operationalization is sort of the practical nitty gritty uh, detail and these things they go they go hand in hand with each other. So you have one example. So let's say we want to talk about uh, socioeconomic status. It's one of those things that you come across with socioeconomic status. People talk about it. What the hell does it mean? And uh, and then what we would actually go, we would have different items, we would have different indicators that capture that idea. You know, there, there's something about your socioeconomic status and the things that we usually ask in that context. Income, wealth, education, occupation, and these things. You see, now these are different items. Well, at, at the end, this could be different questions. If I were to, to do a survey or something, but it could be something else as well. You know, if I go through some, some documents, different items that then together form a variable that represent, that is a measurable representation of the construct socioeconomic status. Okay. So as already mentioned, you know, often uh, there is not just one indicator that would allow us to capture uh, a construct in its entirety, right? So there can be different facets of it, or even for a single dimension of a construct, it can be sometimes difficult to find just one question that kind of hammers, hammers that down. Uh, so often what we do, we have multiple indicators, you know, we ask multiple questions, or we kind of probe into different directions, uh, to, to capture the construct that we are actually interested in. Why do we do that? Well, because if we would have just a single indicator, you know, we could incorrectly classify individuals, while if you kind of, let's say, if I ask you many different questions uh, that all go into the direction of, um, uh, I, I don't know, how happy you are, right? I asked you, uh, did you have a great day, or uh, how was your weekend? Uh, uh, all sorts of, sorts of things, right, that kind of, then give me a better picture of how happy you are at the end of the day. So, single indicators might be problematic because we might misqualify, uh, misclassify individuals. But when we ask several things, you know, the, the the risk of kind of putting one person in the wrong category is sort of uh, uh, not not as big. The other thing, you know, that single indicators may capture only a portion of the underlying concept. 
or they, maybe they are too general, right? So maybe there are just different things that matter here and I would have to ask different things. Um, I can make finer distinctions with multiple indicators and um, yeah, catch a different dimension. Okay. So that's basically what I wanted to talk to you about with conceptualization. Conceptualization is sort of this mental process of coming from, you know, from the theory that we have, the concept, narrowing this further down, thinking about what does it actually mean, you know, and being clear about what it means, thinking about what are sort of the dimensions involved here, then to operationalization, which is sort of really the nitty gritty practical decision that I make, how I'm going to measure it at the end of the day. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk to you about are levels of measurement, levels of measurement. And um, this goes back, this ties back to this question that I had at the beginning that didn't work for whatever reason, I don't know why, uh, with nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio scales. Okay. So basically these are the four things. And these are, these are important. Huh? These are important and you need to be able, you need to be able to know at what level we are measuring something. And this is important because later on, we can only do certain kinds of analysis with things that we measured at the nominal level, or with things that we measured on an ordinal level, or with things that we measured on an interval level. Right? But these are all stuff that we will come back later on. Okay, let me start with nominal measures, what we mean by that. Well, nominal measures are basically Things that have uh, uh, they are dist distant classes, uh, and, but these classes have no quantitative properties. So the easiest way to think about this is really in terms of an example. You know, biological sex, right? There's male and female. There's no high or low, right? I cannot order that. It doesn't make sense. Why would I order that? It doesn't make sense. I cannot think of a distance here. I cannot think of an average or anything like that, right? So that's really just a category. And a lot of the question that I've been asking you guys was always on this nominal level, right? I ask you, is it this or that or that, you know? And in, uh, ideally, well, actually, they have to be mutually exclusive, so that it should be, should be, uh, should be clear that where, where, uh, where some, somebody, somebody belongs into, but when we construct the measures. So that's a nominal measure, and it's really just a, a category. You know, do you, I don't know, does a person belong to this bucket, that bucket, or that bucket? Right? And you know, biological sex is one example. Other examples are, are country of origin. You know, these things don't have to be uh, binary or you know, uh, two categories, but it can be many categories. Like country of origin, for example, there could be, I don't know how many countries there are. There could be 150 different countries of origin. But you see, I cannot really, I cannot really calculate an average here. I cannot really order things, right? Which country would be higher or lower? Uh, that, that, with, any, with, with no further information, I cannot, I cannot do that. Yeah. So ethnicity or relationship status, you know, uh, there can be many different categories here. Uh, it can be complicated. You know? uh, and that would be another category. Right? Would be another category, but uh, it's, um, uh, it's, there's no ordering here. Okay, so here I have, you know, uh, just a, a little toy example, country of origin being one nominal measure. And sometimes, sometimes you represent these things with numbers as well. You know, when you have a data set and you see, okay, a country of origin, there are different codes here, one, two, three, four, or whatnot. Right? But then you have to remember, that's sort of why it's so important for you to know which one of my, of my measures is actually nominal, because, uh, because then you need to know that these numbers, they're just placeholders for different names here. Right? I cannot, you, cannot, you cannot go and do something with these. You, you could. Probably you could calculate in your, in your software then a mean, but it doesn't make any sense at all. Because your, your, your measure was nominal to begin with. Okay, so that's a nominal measure. Let me move on to the next one that we call ordinal measures. Ordinal measures are essentially about rankings. Right? One is first, one is second, the other one is third, and so on. You know? High or low, or whatever. Right? There's an, there's an ordering that I have here. That's where ordinal comes from. Uh, for example, you know, uh, here, uh, final position of horses in a race. Don't ask me why I have this example, I don't know. Um, uh, the, one horse is first, the second, other one is second, and so on, right? And then we have just positions. We don't really have 
I don't know, were they uh, five seconds earlier or were they 10 seconds earlier? It's really just about the ordering that we have, right? Could be high or low. What is your, I don't know, education, educational degree? Yeah. University degree, I don't know, high school degree, uh, something lower and so on. It's difficult to tell, okay, what is the difference here? Right? We don't really know the difference yet, but we know that, I don't know, a PhD is higher than a master's, but we don't know how much, how, how would you quantify that anyway? It's kind of difficult. But you know the one is higher than the other, or the other one is lower than something else, uh, or uh, so on. So that's sort of an ordering that we have. And um, we don't have, that's sort of the key, and hopefully that becomes clear now when I move on to the, to the next one, to the interval scale. We don't know about the differences yet. Ordinal scale is really about ranking. That's how you have to think about it. There's really a ranking. Whatever that ranking means. But it's different from just uh, biological sex, yeah? Because there you, I don't know, you couldn't have a ranking, right? You, s you see how sort of there's sort of additional information then in, in something that is an ordinal measure compared to something that is a nominal measure, which then ultimately allows you, you to do other uh, more sophisticated analysis. And that's sort of a mistake that you can make. You know, you can measure something that's actually on an ordinal scale, you measure it on a nominal scale, right? Or something that is on an interval scale, you measure it only on an ordinal scale. And that brings you into all sorts of troubles because then you cannot do the analysis that you wanted to do. Okay, so we have nominal. Now it's just really it's just categories. We have ordinal, the sort of rank orders, right? First, second, third, or whatever that means, high, low. The next one is what we call interval measures. <coughs> interval measures. They are, you know, there's a clear ordering here as well. You see, actually, these measures, they become more and more sophisticated. Yeah? So everything that I'm kind of telling, uh, interval, everything that you can do with nominal stuff, uh, you can also do with, uh, with ordinal measures, and everything that you can do with, uh, with ordinal measures, you can also do with interval measures. That's sort of uh, um, how, how things are more, um, more sophisticated. So an interval measure, there we can compare things with one another. Right, I kind of mentioned this example before. That sort of the differences make sense. Yeah? So let's say I have, um, I know that 25 degrees Celsius is three degrees hotter than 22 degrees Celsius. So I know this is sort of the, the same amount, it, it is hotter than when I would look at 17 degrees Celsius and 14 degrees Celsius. Yeah? So that's sort of the, the distance is clear. And in the ordinary measure, that was not the case. Right? There we just had high and low, and it was somewhere on this scale, and we didn't really know where it was. Right? There could have been between the, the lowest and the middle category, it could have been a very tiny step, and then a huge step from the middle to the last one, we didn't know. And we will have some examples about how, how these things can, uh, can, can actually screw up results as well on, on Wednesday. So with interval measures, the intervals make sense. Yeah? The differences between 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 things that we that we do measure, we can we can interpret them, right? The the distance the the, the difference between twenty five and twenty two is sort of something that we can interpret. We can compare it to something else, right? We know that this is sort of I don't know uh, a moderate increase. While if there would be ten degrees uh, increase, it would it would be it would be more. Right? That's an interval measure. An example here you know, we have. Uh, um, degree in, in Celsius. Why degree in Celsius? Because there is no true zero. Um, what do we mean by that? Well, interval scale, that's something that you, wh where, they, where the distinguishing part then is from, from interval to ratio scales, with interval scales and interval measures, there's no, there's no zero point that, um, that means absence of whatever you're measuring. Right? Of course, when you have, you know, you measure temperature, you know, there's zero degrees Celsius, and that means whatever water freezes and so on. But we cannot say, we cannot say that 40 degrees Celsius is twice as hot as 20 degrees Celsius. Right? What, does, what does it mean? I don't know, there's 20 more, right? But what, what does this, the zero point mean here? So saying something is twice as, as much as something else only makes sense when you have a, a clear anchor. You know? When you have a clear zero point from, from which onwards you can, you can distinguish things. Right? So, um, with Celsius temperature, that's sort of an interval scale. But for example, I don't know, maybe some of you know, know uh, you can also measure uh, temperature in Kelvin. 
Kelvin has an absolute zero point, uh, has an absolute scale. It means when down the molecules, when do they stop moving, right? And uh, the zero degree uh, Kelvin is, I think, minus 273 or something like that. It's really cold. And um, that would be, would have an absolute zero point. Okay, and this zero point, that's sort of the, the key distinguishing feature to what we call ratio measure or the ratio scale. So here, you no, know, it's sort of, as I said before, a ratio measure is, is, has all the qualities that, uh, that a nominal measure has, an ordinal measure has, and uh, an interval measure has. But it has on the top of that, that uh, the quality that there is, there is a true zero point that has a meaning. The example that we can have here is the height of a person. Uh, the height of a person. Um, first of all, you know, the interval thing, we know that the difference between somebody who is 140 or 140 centimeters and 150 centimeters, you know, that's 10 centimeters, and we know that's sort of the same thing as uh, the difference between somebody who is uh, 170 centimeters and somebody who is 180 centimeters. Yeah? So that's sort of that's interval thing. Sort of there's a, there's a distance between the things, and we can interpret, we can meaningfully interpret these uh, these these distances. But now on the top of that, now on the top of that, in the ratio scale and the ratio measure, we have an absolute zero point that allows us to make statements like the last one here, uh, that that 180 centimeters is twice as much as 90 centimeters. You see, now it makes sense because zero would be nothing, right? And then we can appear, and so we kind of think we can make a statement. Like that. That's how, how you can how you can also um, try to check if you um, when you uh, when you're unsure is something interval or ratio uh, scales. You can think about can we say that if I double the quantity, does it make sense to interpret this as twice as much as the quantity before? That's how how an easy way how you how you can think about that. And with height, we can do that. Or with income, we can do that, right? Because income has an absolute zero point. Right. There could be zero income, and then I know if, I don't know, uh, if somebody gets uh, 4,000 euros uh, compared to somebody who gets 2,000 euros, this other person gets twice as much. Right. While, think about intelligence, right. somebody who has uh, an, uh, an IQ of, uh, of 150 compared to somebody who has an IQ of 100, is this person now 50% more intelligent? I don't know. Difficult to say. It's really just this measure. What would be zero? IQ of zero doesn't make sense. Actually, uh, it doesn't. It doesn't exist. Yeah. Okay. So these are sort of these four different uh, ways how um, how things can be scaled, and often they are just naturally scaled like that. You know, I don't know. I cannot. I cannot enforce an ordinal scale or an interval scale on something like biological sex. Right? That is a nominal category. Ethnic. Uh, uh, ethnic groupings, for example, that is a nominal category. Right? While then something else like height, you know, uh, it's sort of at a higher level, which, which would then be a ratio scale. Okay, so why do we care? Why do we care? Uh, it's always important to ask the question, why do we care? Um, well, because these different levels of measurement, they really matter for what you can do with your things at the end of the day. Right? And this is stuff we will come back to at the, towards the end of the lecture. Uh, for example, you can only calculate an average. You can only calculate an average on something that is on the interval or on the ratio scale. You cannot calculate an average, an average on something like biological sex. Doesn't make sense. Or what is an average on, on ethnicity? Doesn't, that doesn't make sense. And it, these are the kind of things that are so easy to do you know, because, I don't know, you use software or use whatever, uh, um, you just type in some stuff, you press some buttons, and there's something coming out of that, but it doesn't make sense you know, because your measure is not on the appropriate level. With, uh, um, so when we have something that is on an ordinal scale, for example, remember that was sort of this rank order that we have, we also cannot calculate an average, right? Because we only have high or low, but we don't really know the differences. The differences don't make sense here, right? And in order to calculate the average, we would have to know about the differences. Well, luckily there are some other things that we can do. For example, the median. Median, we will come back to that later on. But just to preface it a little bit, the median is sort of the value that is situated in the middle, right? Let's say if I would ask people about their, um, their highest degree, educational degree, 
And then I kind of look at, okay, I have some people that, uh, I don't know, have a high school degree only that side of the high school, others have bachelors, others have masters, others have PhDs or whatnot. And, and then I would uh, look at, okay, uh, which, which of those four values that I have or how many values that I have is sort of the value where, where if I would go into the one direction, if I would go into the other direction, it's sort of just in the middle. Right? I cannot say anything about the distances, but I can say something about where is the, where is the, where is the middle point here. And the last one for nominal, uh, for nominal um, scales, we, can't, we cannot do that either, right? We, can, we, can, we, cannot, we cannot calculate an average for a nominal thing. As I said before, it doesn't make sense to think about an average for biological sex. But it also doesn't make sense to think about, okay, which sort of the, the lowest 50% uh, um, they belong to these categories and the highest 50% belong to these categories. It doesn't make sense here either because we don't have a, an ordering, we don't have a ranking. But what we do can, we can look at a mode. And a mode is essentially that category that, that most people selected. Right? So if there are more females than males, the mode would be female. Okay, so let me get to the fourth part that I want to talk about. You know, after some definitions, conceptualizations, and operationalizations, and these four levels of measurements, which are such exam questions, you know, where I'm going to ask you, what is a nominal scale, or I want you to distinguish these things from each other. Um, the last one is about how can we go and say something about the quality of the stuff that we measure. You know, how, how good are we in measuring the things that we actually want to measure? And here we talk about two concepts, two concepts that are important here, and they are not the same, they are not the same, they are reliability and validity. I'll talk more about each one of them um, separately, but just as a, as a quick thing at the beginning so that you know, maybe, maybe this helps to understand what these things, what these things are. Right? Reliability basically means, do you measure the same thing when you keep measuring it? Right? And you can see here now at the, at the top, uh, at, the, at the left graph, right, sort of these little dots, they sort of measure the same thing, right? So they're sort of good in coming to something, but they're still off target, right? So that's sort of what I meant about, um, you know, I can, I can stand on my bathroom weight uh, and I get the same result for one week long, uh, and I think, oh, I found it, I know how, how heavy or how light, how light I am, but still, uh, it's, it's wrong because my, my, my bathroom weight is, is off. Right? It's just crooked. You know? I don't know, battery or something like that. So you can have something, you can be reliable in measuring something, but it can be not valid. You know? And that's sort of the, the example here at the left. And now in the middle you see something that is valid but not reliable. Right? Yeah, you measure what you want to do, but you're still pretty much off in terms of when you go and when you kind of go and, uh, and repeat your measurements. Reliability is always about do you get the same result when you go and measure the thing again. Right? So you see how actually in the middle example, we are not off, right? but we're just not good at getting towards what we actually want to measure. So that would be valid but not reliable. Ultimately what we want to have, we want to measure things that are valid and reliable. Right? We want to be clear that we kind of get the same stuff because if we get different things, well, then we have a problem. Yeah? Well, then maybe our measures are not that good. And we want to be on target. Right? So we want to get what we actually want to, want to get. That's already the, 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 the reliability and validity stuff. But let me talk a little more about that. Okay, so reliability, you know, as I said before, it's sort of a measure is reliable when you get the same result from an object when you apply it repeatedly. I had this example with me standing on my bathroom scale, and, uh, and uh, it would be reliable if it would tell me the same thing uh, uh, when I step off and on. Sometimes I do this, you know, check if I got a little lighter, but I didn't. Uh, uh, and then you see, do I get the, sort of the same, the same thing? Is this reliable? Reliability is not the same as accuracy, right? Or being valid. Remember the little graph with the, with the arrows, you know, where they shoot? You can be reliable but you're still off target. Okay, so the example here is, you know, the, the bathroom <coughs> scale is just five kilos off, it's just always added or, or, or scraped it and whatnot. Okay, so um, there are different versions of reliability, you know, things where, um, that matter in different contexts. Let me talk about these three a little bit. So one kind of reliability is what we call inter-rater reliability. Inter-rater reliability. 
What, what does it mean? Basically, it means to with different people. First of all, it matters when a researcher has to classify something, right? I have to put people in categories or something like that. And then something is high on inter-rater reliability if different people would get to the same results. That's out of the thing. And practically, you know, when you have, I don't know, you have big, big questions or, or you need to categorize some things, or even you know, for, your, for your exams at the end of the term, right? You could think of inter-rater reliability. Inter-rater reliability would mean do people, and there will be different people who grade your exam, do different people come to the same results? So what we do then, actually, then we check this kind of stuff. We split things up, you know, this guy marks these exams, this guy marks these exams, but then we also have some overlap, and then for this overlap we see what did this guy come up with, what did this guy come up with, and then we kind of see do they come, do they produce the same result. And if they do, then we would be good on inter-rater reliability. Right? So that's often sometimes what you do. You have different people kind of rating stuff, and instead of just having, having the mutually exclusive, you also have some overlap. And then based on this overlap, then you can look at what did this one guy come up with for, for this thing that they had to categorize, and what did this other guy come up with for, for what they had to categorize. And then you see, well, first of all, if they don't come up with the same stuff, you have a problem. Yeah? Then you have a problem, then you, then you have to do something, something, some, some, something different. Mm -hmm. But if they do come up with the same thing, then we have inter-rater reliability. Another form of reliability is what we call test-retest reliability. So here, basically, the idea is it's a consistency. Is there are we consistent in two measures of the same constructs at different points in time, right? So I don't know. I step on my bathroom scale. I step off. I step on it again. I step off. I step on it again. Right? If I sort of I get kind of the same result, then I'm high on test retest reliability. Right? Split half reliability. Split half reliability is. You know, remember I said that sometimes we actually use multiple indicators to measure one thing, right? Happiness, and, and that's actually what happens when you look at these big questionnaires, there's a battery of questions, you know, 10 questions on, that all go into this direction. Right? Nobody is going to ask you directly certain things, but sort of the, the, uh, there are different things that capture, capture different ideas. Split half reliability would mean, okay, what if instead of, let's say I have these 10 items, that I use to measure happiness, what if I would split them into, into halves, you know, one with five items in each and one with the other five items. If they are sort of good, they should come up with the same stuff, sort of, right? Or it shouldn't be completely off, right? Of course, the more that you have, the more, the more, the more accurate you're going to be, uh, but, um, but when you're completely off, then something is, something is wrong with uh, the way you designed your, your questions and your items. Okay. So validity, let me move on to that one. Validity is a measure uh, for how valid or accurately uh, do our measure reflect the concepts that we want to. Right? So how, how good reliability means do we get the same stuff? Do we get the same stuff? Do we measure again and again? And validity means do we actually get what we want to get? Right? And there are sort of different versions for that as well, and this can be, this can be confusing. Uh, let me quickly talk about these three at the, at the highest level. So translational validity, we mean basically, um, did we do a good job? Did we do a good job in translating our construct into something uh, that we measure, right? And, and there we can split it further up. Uh, face validity means, does it make sense? And uh, maybe it just doesn't make sense at all. Content validity means, uh, do we capture all the facets that are important for, for a construct? Criterion related validity means um, is there something, can we test this against something uh, from the outside? But uh, maybe I'm going to come back to that later on. I don't want to push this here uh, because these things are important. The take home message here for now is reliability is not validity. This is sort of how you should remember it, right? You can be on target, but you can be, uh, you can have the same thing, but you can be off. And uh, we see each other on Wednesday, and then we talk more about this. Stuff.